Hi, I'm Martin Tickle. I want to tell you about a very special people that braved death rather than give up their faith. For centuries, this persecuted people stood firm for their faith in God. They're known as the Waldenses of Italy. Many a Waldensian lost his life in this world in order to secure that better life in the world to come. These faithful people, outcasts, hidden from the world in remote Alpen recesses, were considered heretics and deserving only death by the ecclesiastics of their age. But not so in heaven. There they were regarded as members of a noble line of faithful Christians. Centuries before the Reformation, the Waldenses possessed the Bible in their native tongue, making them objects of hatred and persecution. Their religious belief was inherited from their forefathers, the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. This church in the wilderness, prophesied in Revelation 12, was the true church of Christ, the guardian of Bible truth which God had committed to his people long ago, shedding beams of light into the dense darkness of those ages, this beacon of light would preserve his truth pure and unadulterated for future generations. Lux lucet in tenebris, the light shineth in the darkness. Even today, this Waldensian motif shouts God's challenge to the darkness of this world. When God has a special work for his people to do, he often chooses the most favorable environment to complete it. So it was with the Jews in Palestine, at the crossroads of the nations. Likewise with the Waldenses in their mountain retreats. Here men held fast to their old customs and faith and were least affected by the changing world around them. Here we are in the Valley of the Invincibles, where 80 Waldenses withstood thousands of enemy soldiers for several months. These alpine mountains and nearly inaccessible valleys, guarded by mountain ranges, perpendicular rocks, mountain peaks and frightful precipices, formed a secure haven in which their faith could be preserved. At the same time, their central location between France and Switzerland allowed them to faithfully spread the gospel north and south, east and west. No other spot in Europe seems so well adapted to their mission and safety. At times, God sent an impenetrable mist that settled down over everything like an obscuring blanket. These dense clouds of fog shielded his people from their oppressors. Caves like this one, rocks and dense forests, were their friends, when the rest of the world seemed their enemies. John Ledger, a Waldensian pastor and author, puts it this way, The Eternal, our God, having destined this land to be in a special way the theatre of his marvels and the haven of his ark, 
has by natural means most marvellously fortified it. Who were these Waldenses? What made them willing to sacrifice everything to serve God? In the Italian language, Waldenses are called Valdesi, that is, valley men. The French word for Waldenses is Vaudois, stemming from Vaux, meaning valley. Some name them after Peter Waldo, a prominent leader among them in the late 12th century. But his followers were called the poor men of Lyon, and not Valdesi. They would logically have been named Waldenses after the valleys they lived in, rather than after Peter Waldo. In any case, these Cotian Alps provided a refuge since post-apostolic times for those Christians opposed to the errors of Rome. Around 400 AD, centuries before Peter Waldo, a Christian leader called Vigilantius Leo lived in this area. He courageously condemned the worship of images, prayers for the dead, saint and relic worship, and celibacy of the clergy. 400 years later, another outstanding figure was Claude, a bishop of Turin, now called Torino. He also opposed the increasing errors in the church, ordering the removal of all images from the churches. He preached justification by faith alone and denied the doctrine of purgatory. The stake began to claim the lives of dissidents as early as the 12th century, and many were imprisoned for their faith. The first massacre of the Waldenses was on Christmas Eve of 1400. 100 died when their villages were torched. 50 fleeing mothers with their children froze to death on the icy mountain slopes. 1484. Under Captain Cataneo, an army is dispatched to force the Waldenses into submission. God sends a dense fog that confuses the attackers, and the men of the valleys escape. 1488, the same Captain Cataneo enters the Vale of Lois in eastern France, forcing the 3,000 inhabitants of the valley to retreat into an immense cavern on a bluff of Mont Pelvoux. They enter with their old and young, their cattle, their children, their babies. The soldiers fear to follow them into the cave, so they set a fire at its mouth. All 3,000 Waldenses die, including 400 mothers with babes in their arms, mercilessly suffocated. This simple sign is a stark reminder of that tragedy. It reads, the hill of the dead men, the execution of the Vaudois. Here on this historic site in 1532, the Waldenses joined the Reformation. They are encouraged by the reformers to leave their caves and mountain hideaways, to come out of their closet, to build their own churches, to bring their religion out into the open. They do so with the most horrendous massacres of their history as a result. 1560, hoping to uproot this heresy forever, the Waldenses are commanded to attend mass under the threat of death. They refuse. Their valleys are ravaged, Monstrous cruelties are inflicted over a period of 15 months, but the enemy is finally forced to retreat by only a handful of these stalwart mountain men who put their trust fully in the Lord. 1630, the bubonic plague reduces the Waldensian population by more than one half. Now only three pastors remain alive. French-speaking pastors from Geneva replace them. 
1655, an edict demands that within a few days the people must attend Mass and get rid of the pastors who are their spiritual and community leaders. They refuse. An army of 15,000 men enters the valleys and tortures all whom they can find, putting many to death. Men, women and children are thrown from this peak called Castelluzzo. Their broken bodies pile up on the rocks below. None are spared in this holocaust. Called the Bloody Easter, protests of Englishmen bring a short respite to their persecution. 1686, another decree demands the Waldenses forever cease their religion. All churches are to be leveled to the ground. All pastors must leave the valleys and all children are to be raised Catholics. The Waldenses again refuse. 3,000 are brutally massacred. 12,000 are thrown into poorly kept prisons. After some months, pressure from various Protestant powers brings about the release of the mere 3,000 now still alive. Forced into exile to cross the Alps in midwinter, there are many more casualties. The survivors are received mercifully in Geneva with open arms. In 1689, 800 armed Waldenses return in a heroic attempt to recover their valleys. After valiant victories, they are finally trapped by a heavily armed French army into an apparently inescapable situation. But again, God miraculously gives them a means of escape. Within a few days, they learn that a truce has now been signed. They are once more allowed to continue their worship relatively undisturbed. The bloody massacres are ended, but there are still numerous restrictions. They still cannot vote, hold public office, or educate their children in schools outside of their valleys. 1848. This monument was erected by good King Alberto to the Waldenses, in gratitude for their loyal service under his reign. By his order, these restrictions are finally lifted to their great rejoicing. Each February 17th, through this parade and numerous bonfires throughout their valleys, the Waldenses still celebrate this momentous occasion. Now let's take a more recent look at this amazing people. Those who visit Italy today in order to see merely classical antiquities, medieval palaces, famous artwork or ornate sculptures may never visit the Waldensian valleys. For their real interest in the valleys lies not in the natural but in the spiritual. There are no antiquities nor have the arts ever flourished here. Life has always been too full of reality. Our interest lies far deeper, you see, for in the valleys we see God himself was at work. He kept the light burning in spite of every attempt to extinguish it. Like the burning bush of Exodus 3 verse 2, though often aflame by fiery persecutions, the church was never consumed. The Waldensian church still exists today. Today, the total Waldensian population living in these historic valleys is about 15,000. Another 20,000 Waldensian church members live in other parts of Italy and 15,000 more in South America. Waldensian descendants founded the city of Valdez, North Carolina, where they still preserve their faith. We are in the interior of a rustic Waldensian house. 
the simple stove provided all the heat and cooking for the family. Here you see the types of house they traditionally built, stones laid up without mortar. Steps lead up to the wooden balcony, usually running the full length of the house, on a level with the first floor, where the family ate and slept. The ground floor typically housed an assortment of livestock, hay, farm produce and agricultural implements. Their forebears sometimes slept with the cattle in the winter for warmth, as firewood was too expensive for this peasant folk to purchase. The roof is composed of these large, thin, flat stones, mined locally, and last for several hundred years, that is, until the supporting beams finally rot away. In the book of Hebrews, it is written, They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains, and in dens and caves of the earth. Hebrews 11, 37 and 38. When forced to flee to their mountain retreats, they endured hunger, fatigue, cold and nakedness, and yet, these scattered and homeless Waldenses would assemble to unite their voices in singing and praising God that they were accounted worthy to suffer for Christ's name. They encouraged and cheered one another and were grateful for even their miserable retreat. Even when their children sickened and died from cold and hunger, yet the parents did not think for a moment of yielding their religion. All because they prize the love and favor of God far above earthly ease or worldly riches. Well deserved is their unique place in the royal line of faithful Christians, the world's nobility in its highest sense. Today, all Christians, especially the youth, are being called to take their places in this royal line, in service, in sacrifice, in taking the everlasting gospel to the world. As we regretfully leave these beautiful valleys, our minds are drawn again to that story which only the books of heaven will reveal one day soon. Imagine, if you will, that if their voices could only be heard, what a history the mountains surrounding these valleys could give of the experiences of God's people because of their faith. As we watch them climb the steep mountain paths, they probably have in mind not the homes they have left, although they still hope to possess them again, but they are looking for a home so high that the highest peak of the Alps cannot reach it, a home with their heavenly Father in the mansions that Jesus has gone to prepare for them, from which they will never be driven. Therefore they can well afford to leave their earthly treasures to grope their way among dark and crooked paths and to be enclosed in rocky chambers away from the light of day if, by this means, they can attain that home among the blessed, a home not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Surely angels must have talked with these lonely fugitives as a person speaks to a friend, leading them to places of safety. No doubt, the encouraging words of these angels renewed their drooping spirits and carried their minds above the tops of these mountains to see by faith the white robes, the palm branches, and the shining crowns of victory awaiting them around the great white throne in heaven, when they will be safe forever. Jesus' promise is sure, 
be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Revelation 2 verse 10 Do you want to be part of that royal line? Jesus Christ has made it possible for you if you will surrender your life fully to him. Wonders of a Christ, head of the Lord.